action. And tonight we are. Ron, are you recording? Yes. Sorry, Jim. You're recording? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to be sure. So at the beginning of this meeting, because we're not meeting at town hall and we're meeting virtually through Zoom, um, I ask that all participants mute themselves if you're not speaking. Uh, Zoom, if you're on a computer, uh, if you're muted, you can actually hold down the space bar to speak and let go of it. Once you're done speaking, that's a little um, good practice. And this being this meeting is actually being recorded per Governor Lamont's executive order 7.B. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Again, we're trying to adhere to the governor's overall executive orders to stay home and stay safe with the pandemic going on. Uh, so again, virtual meeting. At this point in the meeting, uh, bring uh, general comments to the floor. Uh, Don, did any comments come in from the public? Anyone would want to speak tonight? No, I didn't receive anything. Okay, so no comments from the public have been received. So we'll move on to the public meeting portion of the meeting. Uh, we have application number 718-20. It's Ucello Development LLC, 143 Old Reservoir Road, Lot 12, Parcel number 053-031. It's an application for a new single family home within a regulated area. And with us tonight, um, representing the applicant, we have, uh, Kevin. looks like Kevin Johnson. Yeah. yeah, Kevin Johnson, Close Johnson and Miller. Matt Gustafson. Yeah, this is Matt Gustafson. I'm also uh, the wetland scientist that'll be representing Uccello uh, from All Points Technology. You want uh, you want me to share the screen now, Kevin? Show your plot plan. Sure. What do you want to do? Sure, that's fine. Whoa! You're Whoa! Doing, you're doing 143 first. Right. Oh. You guys see that all right? You want to zoom in on the, the lot? Or do you want to do the full sheet? Uh, maybe zoom in on the lot. I'm trying to. Can people get a left click and hope they are. Is that? No, you guys should do it. Is that, is that is that better? Is that can you see something there? Yeah, I mean that's fine. I've I've got a paper copy here too, so okay. Everyone ready? Yes. Okay, so for the record, Kevin Johnson, uh close Jensen and Miller. Uh I, I thought just for the benefit of anyone who's not familiar with the development, just a brief uh history uh of this. Um, so this is a subdivision that was designed uh, by others in, in the early 80s. Um, it consisted of 12 lots. Um, some of the roadway infrastructure, storm drainage, uh, sanitary sewer was installed, you know, 35, 40 years ago. Um, it, for whatever reason, the project went dormant um, for 30, 35 years. About five years ago, the project was resurrected. Um, we did have at that time the wetlands redelineated. Um, at the time, it was a different soil scientist, but nonetheless, there were some changes in the wetland limits from the early 80s, from the original mapping um, to five years or so ago. Uh, some of the grading uh, that was indicated on the original subdivision plans. Uh, in, encroached within some of the new wetland uh, areas. And for that reason, we appeared before this commission uh, and presented plans. Uh, approval was granted uh, for 10 of the 12 lots, uh, basically lots three through 12. 
Um, again, because there was grading uh, on several of the lots that encroached into the wetlands, uh, we proposed uh, vegetative enhancements uh, on, I think, three or four of the different lots. Um, and since that time, uh, four homes have been uh, constructed uh, on Whippoorwill Way. Uh, neither of the houses on Old Reservoir Road uh, have been constructed. Um, so currently, uh, Mr. Ucello does have a potential buyer uh, for this lot. Uh, they're only interested in this one lot. Uh, they're they have worked closely with Mr. Ucello on the footprint of this house. Um, it's obviously been designed to fit within the building setbacks. Um, we, we do encroach into a portion of uh, the wetlands. Uh, these wetlands were delineated by Mr. Gustafson uh, a few months ago. And basically the wetlands line uh, on this lot remain unchanged from about five years or so ago, but I'll, I'll let Mr. Gustafson in a few minutes uh, address uh, that. Um, but, it, but again, um, you know, the, since the original subdivision was designed, the original grading done, um, e even the plans from five years ago, we, we held that same house. Again, there were no buyers at the time for any of these lots. Uh, there were no particular house designs. It was just a basic rectangle. Um, so again, be because there is a particular buyer, they want a particular house. Um, we, we do have uh, an encroachment in into the wetlands, um, particularly the southwest corner of the house. Uh, we encroached about 15 feet into the wetlands uh, on the north side of the house in the rear. Um, we, we really don't have an encroachment there. There'll be a temporary disturbance, but not a permanent one. Um, the way the lot is graded and, uh, basically the, the rear of the house is going to be a walkout. Um, so the grades drop from front to rear and grades slope along the sides, the north and south sides of the house. And we're pretty much at existing grade, uh, at the rear of the house. Um, so we're not going to be doing filling within the wetlands there. Um, but again, we are going to be removing trees, uh, erecting siltation controls, um, you know, establishing some lawn area there. Uh, the, the potential buyer uh, has asked Mr. Urcello, uh if we could provide about 15 feet from the rear of the house to proposed tree line. Uh, just so they don't have any large trees within 15 feet or so of the house. Uh, so that's pretty much what established uh, the proposed tree line. Um, so you'll, you'll note on the plan, we, we, uh, we, we note uh, a, a wetland impact of 2,375 square feet. Um, I, I, I would just like to point out that that 2,375 is not all house. Um, a very small portion of that is the house. Um, that and the sun porch, which actually is on piers, but um, the, the, the permanent uh, impact in the wetland by house is about 560 square feet. So you've got about 1,800 square feet of impact that basically is gonna be revegetated. Um, and to offset that encroachment, we're proposing uh, vegetative enhancements and mitigation and clearing of invasives and so forth on the remainder of the lot. And, and that's to, uh, that's about 10,600 square feet. Um, so at, at this point, I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Gustafson and, and he can walk you through his delineation and findings and uh, his proposal for uh, enhancements and so forth. And, and then I'll come back with a few other comments. Uh, good evening for the record. My name is Matthew Gustafson with All Points Technology. I am the wetland and soil scientist for the project. 
Uh, as Kevin has already stated, I was tasked with delineating and assessing the wetlands and wetland impacts to this site and for this project. Uh, we reviewed the original delineation performed by uh, John Iani in October of 2014, um, redelineated that boundary and found it to be substantially correct. So there was, there was very little uh, deviation from that original boundary that was accepted by the commission um, in 2014. Generally, wetland, uh, this wetland identified as wetland one occurs throughout most of the western extents of the property. It drains generally north to south, um, eventually draining off property towards some of the other uh, residential lots associated with um, Whipperwill Road. It does drain into a storm drain eventually and, and um, moves underground. The system is characterized as a broad forested wetland seep system with interior flooded areas uh, do dominated by some emergent and scrub shrub vegetation. Um, generally forested areas are closed canopy with a fairly sparse understory. Uh, limited invasives were noted throughout the wetlands. Um, the wetland boundary edge that is also being proposed for impacts is characterized as a historic fill um, with evidence of, of disturbance, um, fill mounds, a uh, fairly steep fill edge, and small amounts of refuse and debris. The, again, as part of our assessment, our task assessment, we evaluated the functions and values of this wetland system. And while there are complexities within the wetland, a lot of the functions and values of this system are diminished by the existing proximate development and the size and inputs to the system. So the functions and values that are supported by this wetland include the groundwater recharge and discharge function, uh, flood flow alteration, sediment toxin and pathogen retention, nutrient removal, retention and transformation, and production export and wildlife habitat. Uh, four of the first, the first four of the six that I've mentioned there, all of those uh, functions and values are primarily associated with the filtering capacity of the broad emergent portion of the wetland located interior or to the far west of the or the rear of this property. Um, certainly some of the bordering forested wetlands do provide some opportunity for that. Um, some of those same functions and values, but again, those emergent and scrub shove out, uh, areas to this wetland where stormwater inputs from the surrounding developments are allowed to um, travel through the wetland, uh, filter out some of these various um, toxicants and pathogens and sediments and drop out of the water column. That's where the highest functioning and value portion of this wetland occurs. Um, similarly, because of the complexity of habitat located interior to the wetland, the wildlife uh, habitat function was also found. Um, again, because of the diminished capacity of this wetland due to the proximity of development uh, in the existing condition, None of these wetlands were found to support any of these uh, functions and values at a principal level. They're all determined to be supported at a secondary level. And again, the, you know, the, the extents of the, the wetland and the interface between that and the uplands because of the disturbed, historically disturbed nature of that, that interface, um, those portions of the wetland uh, really serve very little function or value as Kevin has already stated, the project is proposing some direct wetland impacts associated with the uh, far eastern edges of wetland one along that eastern western interface uh, between the upland, the uh, historically filled and disturbed upland edge. As Kevin's alluded to, that most of those impacts are somewhat temporary in nature uh, through the removal of trees to establish this uh, very narrow strip of a backyard um, with about, as you said, 560 square feet of direct permanent impacts associated with the, the actual building footprint itself. The proposed project limits impacts to the periphery of wetland one, which has experienced this recent and historic alterations of the boundary, um, would not result in any diminishment of the functions and values being supported by more core Western extents of this wetland resource. Um, however, we still understand that there are just area being lost of wetlands. So to compensate for that loss, the project is proposing a suite of mitigation measures to protect and enhance 
um, the, this wetland resource, both during construction and post-construction. Um, elements in, for during construction protection include a wetland protection program, uh, which includes routine monitoring and reporting by a, um, ex a professional experienced in wetland mitigation monitoring, uh, contractor training to ensure that the contractor is aware of the sensitive resources and proximity to the project and ensure things like uh, spill containment and prevention measures are maintained throughout construction and that sediment and erosion controls are routinely inspected and maintained, as well as awareness signage posted uh, in proximity to those wetland impacts to ensure, again, that contractors are intimately familiar and anyone else that comes onto the site is made aware of these sensitive resources. Um, Kevin has also, and CGM has developed a fairly extensive erosion and sedimentation control plan to prevent any unintended impacts to this wetland resource. And finally, as, as Kevin's already alluded to, we are proposing a wetland enhancement area that consists of two separate zones, one that will directly enhance the wetland areas and another that will enhance the buffer, the transition zone between the wetland and the newly created uh, backyard. Um, that area is about 10,633 square feet, which is about a four to one ratio of enhancement to impacts um, to the wetlands. These, the, the focus of this enhancement plan is to improve wildlife habitat, water quality protection, and the aesthetics functions and values of this wetland resource. As I previously stated, the existing condition of this interface between wetland one and the uplands is fairly diminished because of historic alterations to that boundary. Um, through this enhancement plan, uh, we expect to be able to improve the quality of that interface while maintaining some of the, the core values found interior to the wetland through the removal of the limited invasive shrub species found in the understory and replacement of those invasives with uh, planted native shrubs. Um, there is on the, sheet, the next sheet from the current sheet that we're looking at, there is a second page to the set of plans that does detail these wetland protection program measures and the environmental notes, as well as a planting schedule that details the species size and, uh, and number of plantings. In total, between the two, um, the upland buffer plantings, as well as the wetland enhancement plantings, there's about a total of 90 plantings proposed. So uh, we strongly feel that due to the limited nature of, of the impacts proposed by the project, plus the the extensive compensation of wetland enhancement that we're proposing that we that the project would not have a significantly negative impact on this wetland resource. So at that point, I think I will hand it back over to Kevin to uh, conclude this. So thank you. Kevin, you're, uh, you're breaking up. Oh, well, you're right now. Kevin, you're, you're muted too, if that helps. So I know Kevin had some, this is Matt Gustin again, I know Kevin had some issues the last time he was on a Zoom call. So he might be experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, oh, looks like he might be back. Sorry, I'm back. On cue, Kevin. I can hear you. So I, I, I just wanted to mention there, there was staff comments uh, dated March 27th. 
Uh, we did respond to those uh, comments uh, in a memo um, that was dated April 29th. Uh, there was one uh, additional memo um, that was issued on May 5th. Basically, uh, engineering had no further comments that required uh, revisions. Uh, basically, again, a reiteration, um, you know, regarding the wetland impacts by the proposed house. Um, again, it's it, it's a different housing market uh, today. Um, you know, it's a desirable area of town, and um, it's I, I I think Mr. Ucello has a, a buyer who is probably the best suited for this lot. Um, who have, you know, from what I'm told, they have no desire to uh, have any other backyard activities or to put a future pool in or anything of that sort. So, um, again, we, we do acknowledge we have that intrusion with the footprint into the wetlands, um, but with the enhancements we're proposing, we feel we've uh, proposed a responsible plan. And with that, do um, you guys have any, we can open it up for questions for Kevin or Matt. James, this is Lou. I just have one question. Okay. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, uh, Kevin, how much water um, is pushed off the lot now with the build? Do you know how much additional is going to run off? Uh, I I don't have uh, you know any numbers at hand. Um, I was just wondering. You, you know, again, I mean, the, the site grades from uh, east to west. I mean, basically, we're continuing those drainage patterns. Um, we've tried to grade the front yard um, so that there's very little of the driveway that will run into the roadway. That that most of it will sheet into the grass areas. Again, just trying to maintain as much as possible the existing drainage patterns. Okay, thank you. And then I, I did have a question for Matt. If, um, say the lot, if, you know, there was no direct inland, inland wetland impacts and then there was no invasive removals, would the invasives continue to spread throughout that wetland complex and adversely in, impact it? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly due to its proximity to several public access or public right-of-ways, um, the nexus for invasive uh, cultivation within these wetlands is just, it's very prevalent. So um, to answer your question, yes, I mean, without any sort of active treatment, um, invasives, especially as they work their way towards the interior areas where things are not as much as forested, um, and invasives can really take a better foothold with more access to sunlight and, and resources. I can probably expect to see an increase in dominance as you, know, you see throughout most wetlands in Connecticut. So it, it appears that you know, there's, there's sparse invasives in there now, and it's likely due to the fact that you know, these roads were constructed 30 years ago or uh, whatever Kevin had originally stated for the time scale, and that they're just starting to get a foothold over the last 30 years and uh, we'll continue that progression and intrusion into the interior of this wetland. Okay. And then the, the proposed plannings will help combat that. Yeah, so, you know, certainly you can always remove invasives and there, as long as the growing space is there um, and there's a lack of competition, they'll continue to fight their way back. So part of the plantings or the purpose of the plantings is certainly to improve some of the function and values of the, the understory within this forested area, but the other is to provide a head start in out competing some of the invasives that are taking a foothold and occupying that growing space. Okay, and you'll oversee the removal of the invasives as well as the plantings? Correct. Did anybody else have any questions? Sure. I'll have a couple of questions if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, I'm just curious, you mentioned uh, historic fill in this uh, land. Um, what, what was the land historically? Was this always wetlands? Was it a farm? Any idea? Um, I, I, have no, I have not reviewed the historic images of this site, so I, I can't speak to what it previously was. Um, based on kind of the characterization of the fill when I was doing my wetland investigation, I suspect that it was just areas pushed out during the creation of some of these residential lots nearby and construction of the, the public right of way. Um, and that could date back to however old the construction of, of those kind of those roadways were, um, whatever that may have been prior to it being a, a more formal paved road. Okay, I happen to notice on, you know, just looking at a map on Google, they called it Wildwood Open Space. Does that mean anything or is that just a local terminology? Is that it? Um, so based on the publicly available data, so the critical, so DEEP produces some publicly available data sets um, and natural diversity database does as well for rare species and critical habitats. Um, none, none of those identified resources are, are located on the site. So there's no critical habitats, um, certainly no records of rare species. There's no things like such things as like flood zones located on the property. Um, so without knowing what that, that title refers to, I suspect that it is probably a more local um, yeah. identifier. Okay, so it has no significance then? Certainly, yeah, not from a regulated standpoint, no. All right, as far as the uh, building itself goes, it, um, it's just that one, it looks like part of a room is actually over to wetlands, maybe uh, 12 by 17. Uh, it, it's a porch on piers. Yeah, I see uh, uh, that little uh, gray spot next to it looks like part of the house. Yeah, it's about 11 and a half by 11 and a half. Okay, so that's really the only part of the house that you know protrudes on the wetlands. And the rest of that area well, well, is... Well, well, the 11 and a half by 11 and a half, that's the porch on piers. And then immediately to the south is the actual part of the house. Right, it's right. It's about 11 and a half by 17. Okay. Give or take. Right. Okay. And the rest of that is just all your intention is that is going to be cleared and that's the extent of it though. It won't be used except probably for a lawn or something. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, again, as I had mentioned, clearing some of the trees, the future buyer would like to have trees no closer than 15 feet. Certainly there'll be some disturbance in constructing the foundation. Um, you know, erosion controls and so forth, but the intent is to reestablish at basically the existing same grades and, and reestablish vegetation, lawn. Uh, you had some pictures attached to uh, one of the reports, some, some photos, uh, a couple of them show water. Is, is that actually on the land or is that in back of it somewhere? So yeah, that's that's the interior areas that I had mentioned, and that is located to the rear of the property. And um, actually, on this plan, you can start to see where the contours pick up. So it's, it's generally flat through most of the rear where the wetlands are, and you see it the, the contours kind of pick up again just off property to the uh, far west. Um, that's that area that's associated with some more of those emergent um, and scrub shrub uh, flooded areas where that picture was taken. Okay, so that's actually off the property then? Correct. Okay. Uh, the other thing, you, you mentioned monitoring. The, is it just going to be, I, I wasn't clear on the amount of time that things were going to be monitored. Is it just um, during the construction and clearing the land, land back there and planting or is it go beyond that? Yeah, so it generally follows what a typical or the, the duration of a typical SWIP monitor would in that once the mitigation has been completed and the site is fully constructed and stable and all erosion controls have been removed, then the monitoring is also completed. Okay. And the, the routine of monitoring or the frequency of inspections is generally milestone driven. Um, so that it's usually front loaded. So during the heaviest portions of construction, there's, there's more oversight. And certainly once they're doing the mitigation, um, for the long duration of the mitigation, as long as that takes, there's, there's daily monitoring. Yeah. Um, 
but once they've kind of set their their boundaries and the site becomes more stable, uh, that the, that monitoring tends to um, kind of peter out a little bit more until a final inspection is performed, documenting full completion of the site. And uh, all of these monitoring um, inspections trigger a, a reporting point as well. So reports will be generated and can be provided to the town of those inspections. Okay, so so the the property owner ultimately who buys and lives in the house, they, they won't have any further responsibilities as far as uh, watching what happens in that back? Correct. Okay, no more questions for me. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions or I'm, I'm all set. Any discussion? Is there be a motion to approve to approve the application or I'll make a motion. Can anybody else hear that? Yeah. Is that better? That's better. Better. But Brent, did you want to try again or Close yes, I'd like to make a motion for the application. Okay. So that's a mo motion to, do you want to read it off or? Sure, I'd like to make a motion for approval for uh, the application of um, 143 Old Reservoir Road. With Memorial States, lot 12. And then uh, do we have a second? I'll second. We'll put it to a vote. So all in favor? Aye. 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 I think everybody had to come off mute to do that. Who, uh, who made the first motion? So Brian um, created the motion. Okay. Then I think Clark seconded it. Or no? Was Brent? Nope, nobody else. No, it wasn't me. Lou? Lou. Okay, so Lou seconded it. Yeah. And then uh, we all voted in favor. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Okay. So that passes. Uh, moving on to the second application of the night, which is application number 719-20, USELO development as well. 84 Whippoorwill Way, lot six, parcel number 052-010. It's an application for fill, grading, tree removal within a regulated area. And with us tonight representing the applicant is... Kevin Johnson, Matt Gustafson. And then I think the graphic is up on the screen. Everybody can see it. So if you want to um, tell us a bit, little something about the what the work uh, is being proposed. Yeah, again, uh, for the record, Kevin Johnson, Close Jensen and Miller. Um, so again, history of this lot, um, I'm not going to go through the same, but same time period uh, as, as lot 12. Um, Lot six was actually, uh, I, I previously mentioned that we appeared before the commission um, about five years or so ago. And lot six, uh, 84 Whippoorwill, um, and, and I'll probably refer to these interchangeably, um, but lot six was actually one of the lots that we did some um, vegetative enhancements on. Um, at, at, at the time, um, I believe the concern was, uh, you know, not to drain this wetland area and, and to do some enhancements. I think we had uh, something on the order of 16 uh, blueberry bushes uh, to be planted in that area. Um, and, and there was a drain that I believe the commission wanted added um, to, to relieve any, you know, excess water, but not to, 
uh, totally drain it. Um, so uh, this plot plan, um, th there's various activity that's illustrated on here. This, this is, a, um, as I previously mentioned, there were four houses uh, that have been constructed along Whipperwill Way. Uh, three have already been completed, lot six. Um, just, uh, I, I believe the uh, new owners got a temporary or, or CO uh, just recently on this. So part of the work that's shown on this plot plan has been approved um, through a plot plan by engineering. Um, the house is constructed, um, the pool and grading work and so forth to the rear um, that's going to be constructed, uh, I, my understanding is later this summer. So the focus of the application is between the front of the house uh, and the street. And again, it's that, what I'll call, and, and Matt can correct me, but I'll call it an isolated wetland area. Um, so the future owners, uh, they, they have three primary uh, concerns. Uh, two, two of the concerns basically revolve around safety. The other uh, is, is, is health. Um, so th th their first concern of safety is uh, immediately adjacent to the sidewalk within the street right-of-way of Whipperwill. Um, the, the sidewalk's existing. Uh, basically, there's about a two-foot drop to, uh, the, the, to the ground. Um, it, it's a, they have concerned about safety. Uh, there's children in the neighborhood. Um, now that there's more sidewalks, people are, you know, out walking and so forth. That they're concerned someone not paying attention could, you know, cause harm to themselves by falling off the sidewalk, so to speak. Um, so what they asked was, could we place some fill in there, uh, grade out a slope, um, and encroach into the wetlands slightly. Uh, so what we're proposing is, uh, I believe the quantity is about 23 yards of fill total um, between this and the other area. Um, but basically to create from the edge of the sidewalk about a five to one slope that would slope down to the wetlands. So a fairly gentle slope. Their second area of concern is between the front of the house and the wetland area from the front sidewalk. That's about a three foot uh, drop. Uh, initially, we held back all the grades. Uh, I think we were you know, probably close to you know, two to one in that area. Um, again, same concern, they, they feel the grades are too steep. Uh, again, asked if we could encroach into the wetland slightly. Again, create a five to one slope. Um, so just to flatten that out. Um, the third area of concern has to do with the standing water. Um, there, there's periods of the year uh, where, um, you know, obviously depending upon rain events and so forth, the depth may vary, but that their overall concern is that with standing water there, the elevation of that drain, uh, again, the drain does not drain all the water out of there. They're afraid of mosquitoes and it's gonna become a mosquito breeding area. Uh, and they have health concerns re regarding that. Uh, so they've asked if the drain could be extended and lowered uh, slightly. Uh, so that's the third aspect uh, basically of, of this plan. Um, so again, uh, Mr. Gustafson went out, uh, and did an evaluation of the wetlands, the delineation, uh, created a mitigation enhancement plan. Um, so again, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Matt. Um, just, br just briefly though, um, again, these, these quantities are tabulated on the plan. Um, but between the grading along the sidewalks uh, and, and the work around extending that drain, we've got a permanent wetland disturbance uh, of about 992 square feet. Um, there are some trees that the owner, dead trees in that wetland area, the owner would like to take down and, and, and try and grade the slope, take some of the uh, 
you know, detritus out of, out of the wetlands there, get it to drain a little better. Uh, so there's a temporary impact associated with that of about 900 square feet, and then some temporary disturbance for the tree removal. Uh, that's about 740 square feet. And to offset that, uh, we're proposing that entire area to be enhanced. Uh, and that total area is about 4,930 square feet. Um, so at this point, I think I'll turn it over to Matt and uh, he can summarize his findings and his work and his proposed plantings and enhancements. Thank you, Kevin. Again, for the record, Matthew Gustafson with All Points Technology. Um, same kind of origination on my work on this property as the previous uh, application. I reviewed John Iani's uh, delineation, uh, re-delineated the wetlands and found there to be no substantial deviations between the two. Uh, therefore, we accepted the delineation as it stood and has been already been approved by, the, um, by your commission. Um, this wetland historically likely had connectivity to the larger wetland to the north um, through the construction of Whippoorwill Way, this feature has been isolated. Um, so Kevin, Kevin did correctly uh, identify that this is an isolated feature now from the historically larger wetland complex um, that drained to the north. Um, because of the proximate developments, including residential developments to the east, west, and south, and the public right-of-way, Whippoorwill Way to the north, um, water is impounded uh, within this wetland. Um, likely this wetland did not experience much seasonal or storm-related flooding prior to development, but because of some of the impoundments, um, it is experiencing seasonal flooding. Um, it's not substantial uh, this time. Based on my inspections, it looks like it's, it's four inches or less, and it, it likely uh, it persists throughout the, the spring and uh, probably fall seasons. Um, so there's certainly opportunity for pretty substantial mosquito breeding within this area. Um, the wetland boundaries, as you might expect, are heavily characterized by fill slopes. Um, in the case of the northern and southern slopes adjacent to Whippoorwill Way and the, the sidewalk and the front yard of the mm -hmm. residents in question, those sl slopes are fairly steep. Um, fill escarpment slopes, and they are fairly dominated by um, some limited scrub shrub, um, but mostly emergent vegetation. There is a forested portion of the wetland located to the west um, that you can pick up on an aerial signature. About half of the wetland is currently forested. Um, fairly open canopy, as you might expect from a, a isolated wetland feature like this, with a fairly sparse understory. Because of the proximity to development, you know, essentially it's surrounded on all four sides by, by very close development, it being an isolated wetland, and the fact that there is, uh, there is quite, again, quite a lot of, of input of stormwater um, from the residencies and the, the public right away, it wasn't found that any of the functions and values that could be supported by this wetland were supported at a principal level. Um, what may be unexpected is that uh, two functions of this wetland can be found at a secondary level. And again, that ties into the fact that there is a lot of opportunity for this wetland to filter and sequester some of the stormwater generated by um, all of the surrounding development. So the, the sediment toxin pathogen retention function, as well as the nutrient removal retention and transformation function are both uh, supported at a secondary level. Um, that's further supported by the complexity of vegetative classes within the wetland. And despite how small the wetland is, because there is both forested scrub shrub and emergent vegetation and fairly high density, um, the opportunity for uptake and transformation of, of these various sediments and pathogens mm -hmm. and toxicants is fairly high. Um, certainly if this feature was larger, and maybe had more connectivity to a larger wetland system, you would see some of the functions and values being supported at a, maybe a principal level and maybe more of those functions and values being supported. Again, to reiterate what Kevin had said, the, the 
project as it's proposed has three kind of areas of, of impact. Uh, the first being uh, the broadening of the, the slopes associated with the, the walkway, the concrete walkway to the north and the front yard um, to the south of the wetland. Both of these are fairly steep slopes. Again, to reiterate what Kevin had said, there, there are significant risks for um, anybody, particular, but particularly elderly or, or young folks who may be walking these areas um, to take a wrong step and very quickly uh, find themselves in trouble. Even though it's not a very large slope, it is a very steep slope. And uh, it obviously, as, as many of us know, it doesn't take much to injure yourself. So there is a, a very real potential um, hazard associated with those slopes. So the project is proposing to broaden and widen those slopes um, to the tune of about 992 square feet of, of direct wetland impact that will be permanent fill within the wetland um, to accommodate some of that filling along that northern interface between wetland and the walkway, some limited tree removal will be needed. Um, and that is, that is the second impact associated with this project. About 12 trees and some other uh, dead and dying trees will also need to be removed to accommodate this filling. Um, these are trees located along the edge. Uh, most of them are either in poor health or um, are fairly small in nature. Trees within this resource generally range between um, eight and 14 inches in diameter. And because of you know, the, the proximate development, again, mo mo most of these trees have experienced uh, pretty high edge effects and are in poor health, um, which can also potentially pose a future health hazard as they die and could potentially fall on the public right away or, or within the, the residential yard. The final aspect of uh, wetland impact is associated with relocating the yard drain that was previously approved by your commission. Uh, my understanding of that original intent of that yard drain was to, um, to a certain degree, to drain some of this wetland to prevent standing water in mosquito breeding habitat. Uh, unfortunately, and it was somewhat unforeseen, the storm drain invert, that elevation is set a little too high to properly drain out some of the far west, northwestern portions of the wetland, um, where you're seeing that two to four inches of seasonal inundation. Um, so we're proposing to relocate that storm drain a little bit more interior to the wetland and drop the elevation just slightly, as well as rough grade in, um, for lack of a better term, a swale, but it'll it really be more of a meander to allow for some positive drainage to that swale, as, as most of the problem occurs that as the wetland very subtly drains from northwest to southeast towards the drain, microtopography is preventing really full positive drainage towards that, that swale. Um, associated with that relocation of the yard drain and the minor grading associated to getting some of the hydrology to that, there's about 900 square feet of uh, direct temporary impact associated with the wetland work. Um, so all in, there's about 2,632 square feet of total wetland impacts, of which most, of, a vast majority of it is temporary in nature. Similar to our, the previous application, we were proposing uh, a suite of wetland enhancement and uh, mitigation plans to compensate for this, these losses to the wetland. Um, it should be noted that none of this work, the proposed work, will diminish the current functions and values of this wetland. And in fact, through the enhancement plan and the planting of additional shrubs and creating uh, more complexity in the vegetation classes, um, it actually has the potential to improve the two, the only two functions that are being supported currently by this, by this wetland. So uh, this, this application will have the same wetland protection program uh, proposed under the first application, including routine monitoring and reporting, uh, contractor training, and awareness signage installation. Um, as well as erosion and, and sediment control uh, measures installed and maintained throughout the duration of construction. And similarly, um, while there are very few, if, if, if no invasives within the understory here, we are proposing a suite of plantings to again improve the, the complexity of the vegetation classes within the wetland and to uh, more naturally and, and stimulate the natural progression of succession of this wetland along those filled edges. 
Um, again, the, the enhancement area will encompass about 4,930 square feet. That is a nearly two to one ratio of mitigation to direct impacts. And that the total number of plants proposed to be installed uh, includes uh, about 80 plants. Um, and similarly, again, you can find the planting schedule and all of those environmental notes on the second sheet of this plan set. So through the, uh, the development of this wetland enhancement and mitigation plan, uh, the applicant feels that there will not be a significant negative impact to this wetland resource uh, resulting from the proposed development. So at that point, I'd like to hand it back over to Kevin for any uh, for final statements. Thank you. Yeah, again, um, similar to uh, lot 12, uh, we, were, uh, we were in receipt of uh, staff comments dated March 27th. Again, they were responded to on April 29th. Um, and there was a final memo uh, dated May 6th. Um, based, uh, basically, um, item number one of that May memo uh, talked about a bond um, for driveway work and, and other improvements on the site as I previously mentioned, in, uh, the swimming pool and so forth. Um, that's another aspect of the work. Nothing really to do with um, this aspect. And, and then comment number two, uh, basically again summarized uh, the square footage uh, previous uh, plans from five years ago, disturbance to, to enhancements and, and a similar you know, summary, uh, what Matt just summarized. Um, so again, there's there's no other further comments that need addressed. So, again, similar to uh, lot 12, um, I, I I think uh, given the situation, the safety concerns, the health concerns with mosquitoes, and uh, obviously, you know, we've all seen triple E, uh, you know, concerns. Um, I, again, I think you know Matt's put together a uh, responsible plan on we would ask the commission to act favorably. I think that concludes our comments. Okay, and then um, we can open it up for, for questions to the commission. Um, first question I had was uh, comment number one, is the applicant um, gonna comply with the bond that's recommended by the engineering department? Uh, if, if Nick is on the line, I think uh, he could respond to that, but I, I have not heard that he's not going to comply with that. Yes, uh, that's a conversation that I had with uh, Derek that we would be willing to do that. Okay. And then another question that I had was uh, for Matt, the slopes that are gonna be established and the, the filling that's gonna occur, what will they be uh, seeded with? So I'll have to review the plans. Uh, it's not in fresh memory, but we typically recommend if it's not specified, um, a wetland seed mix uh, procured through New England well, uh, wetlands um, out of Amherst, Massachusetts. It's a locally sourced seed mix that ensures uh, native genetic stock. Um, as well as obviously all native plantings that are suitable for uh, those kind of wetland edges. Okay. Yeah, I did see that on the plans on, on the second page. So that's um, kind of in the middle of the page towards the top. Can I just speak for one second about that? We will probably want to have at least a, right along the very edge of the sidewalk and the uh, driveway area, a mobile strip. And then beyond that, uh, the wetlands, just from a maintenance perspective and uh, aesthetic. Okay, so some will be lawn, some will be wet mix. Yeah, as we, as we get away from the, you know, lawn adjacent to the, the public right away, and then as we get closer or deeper into the wetland, then we would transition over to the wetland seed mix. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you, Nick, for following up on that. Yeah, certainly, the higher edges of that slope won't be suitable for that wetland mix. It just doesn't have the hydrology to support it. 
So a typical contractor's mix um, is much more suitable to handle that fill. But areas that are generally in that six to eight inch fill range, we are still getting some active hydrology. Um, okay. We'll be using that wet mix. And then the improvement, you know, say we're grading a swale to drain to the proposed yard drain. Uh, the standing water uh, will eventually drain out. Will that improve the condition for the existing trees that are out there? You know, could the, the trees that are dying off be just, their, their roots are just getting um, inundated and can't properly breathe? Um, that certainly has some to do with, so portions of the trees um, are fairly well adapted to that condition. I think it's more of the amount of stress being put on the trees. Um, so you have both an elevated water table, you have pretty high edge effects due to, you know, things like wind and, and routine just elements um, hitting these trees. You know, they obviously grew up in a time where they were more protected and haven't adapted the same sort of protections that an open grown tree would. Um, so they're, they're kind of experiencing those increased levels of stress. But to directly answer your question, we, we might be able to see some improvement in the health in the trees by draining out some of these wetlands. But where you would likely really see an improvement in health is in the shrub layer. Um, we really don't see almost any shrubs or any vegetation growing in the flooded areas of the forested uh, wetland portion. And through draining some of that seasonal flooding, um, and obviously we're planning to install plantings in there, um, the only way those plantings are likely to survive in that area is through, uh, you know, and I hate to use the word draining because that has such a negative connotation with wetlands, but really just relieving some of that, that seasonal flooding um, within that, that area. That again was the original intention of, I believe the intention of the commission when this yard drain was originally approved. Um, it just wasn't foreseen that the micro topography was gonna hold back some of that flood waters in that far Northwest corner. And that was my second question too, that looks like the proposed drainage will improve the conditions for the proposed plantings. Actually Correct. give them a better chance. Did anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, Jim, uh, another question for Matt. The drainage swale, is that just a uh, earth swale or is that swale gonna be lined with a stone for maintenance or any of that? No, and that's why I hesitated to call it a swale. It's really just a broad, you know, lack of a better term, dip in the topography in that area. It's really just to break up or allow for the positive drainage and it will be revegetated with the same plantings and wet mix proposed for the other areas. So it will, there'll be, you know, the intent is to make, keep this area as natural as possible and enhance that, some of the natural qualities of this wetland. So, so we certainly want to be riprap or, or fill or, or check dams or anything of that nature to, to be placed within that swale. Over time with the tree canopy, with New England, the leaves falling in the organics, what's gonna ensure that the swale is going to flow over time? So again, this is less of, it's, there's no true assurances that that won't happen. Um, but I think the intent is that we certainly don't wanna create a true drainage swale. Um, obviously, similar to the la other project, I'll be on site during the construction of this quote unquote swale because there will be, it'll be largely driven or the construction will be largely driven by um, very minute differences in the topography out there because the intent of it is not to drain out the wetland and there is a very thin balance that obviously the original installation of the yard drain um, was a little too conservative in the installation and didn't provide almost any positive drainage. Um, of this wetland. And certainly we don't want to go the opposite route now of setting it too low or putting in too much of a swale and truly draining out this wetland. It's really just the intent to remove the surface water um, that's kind of impounding in that far northwest corner. I speak to this as well. Um, given the investment that the uh, owner or, or buyer is making in this property, I would say that it is very likely that they will be meticulous in the maintenance of the site. Um, not only the manicured part of the site, but also the um, more natural part. Any kind of 
debris or branches, leaves, weeds, invasives, I would imagine that they're going to be monitoring it very closely themselves to keep it looking as aesthetically pleasing as possible and ultimately enhancing the function. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I probably didn't fully properly answer your question in that maintenance piece. I don't think we expect there will be a lot of maintenance needed. Um, just through setting the top of that yard drain properly and providing some positive drainage, we should, uh, there's nothing that's gonna hold up um, stormwater once we've kind of removed the very, you know, micro berm that's created in that far northwest corner. So once that, that's allowed to relieve itself and there is a, 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 a point where the water is allowed to relieve itself in this yard drain being set properly, you should continue to have subsurface positive drainage um, through things like vegetation, leaves, um, and even the soil substrate in this wetland. It's, it's largely formed in till, but there is a, a fairly decent uh, sandy cap to this, this wetland, um, likely just due to the years of, of impacts associated with it, you know, fill being washed into the wetland or what have you. So there's, there's, there's very good drainage through the soil substrate um, that should allow for continued drainage even if, um, you know, minor maintenance isn't taken throughout the years. But certainly it's, it's in the, the homeowners are driving this, this request um, due to the, the safety concerns and mosquitoes. So it's in their best interest to keep this thing flowing to ensure that they don't have to deal with mosquitoes. Anybody else have any other questions? Do we have a motion to approve the application? Yes, Lou Sanzero. Um, I'm moving to, I move to approve application 719-2084 with a rule way um, as proposed. Uh, do we have a second on that? I'll second. And then if you want to unmute yourselves and we could put it to a vote. Who is the second? Brian. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So that passes. And that's... Uh, Jim? Jim? Yes. Um, before you go on to the Conservation Commission uh, business, uh, and like a non-agenda item I wanted to talk about a little bit. Okay. Do we want to... We're all done with Kevin, Matt, and Nick, right? Yeah. Right, Don? Yep. If yeah, they want to, if they want to, you guys can go if you'd like. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank Good you luck. for accommodating this in these difficult times. Thank Appreciate you. Your time tonight. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Patience with us. Stay well. You too, Stay guys. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Derek, do you want to talk about Highland Street at all and plant a mill and pay? Uh, Highland Street this summer would just be crossing the floodplain. I don't think there's any impacts in there as far as fill or changes in the elevation, but Derek can explain a little better. Yeah, uh, two years ago, the town submitted an application for um, state local capital, local transportation capital improvement funds, lots of, um, we were awarded, one of the projects we were awarded was Highland Street from uh, doing some pavement rehab from the Rocky Hill Town Line going north to the intersection with Thornbush Road. Um, there is a small stretch kind of midway in the project between uh, Two Rod Highway and Thornbush Road where we are into um, the floodplain a little bit. Um, the plan on the project is primarily to be taking out, we had a full pavement design done and we're gonna be taking out two and a half inches of pavement and putting back three and a half inches of pavement. So the road grade will probably go up about an inch um, but it's really going to be contained curb to curb. Um, we'll be doing some curb replacement. So I'm talking with Don about it. Uh, we just felt it was minor enough that it probably didn't warrant a full application, but just want to make you aware of the project in case you see it going on out there and any questions. Um, we're hoping to put that out to bid next month with this, with this starting in late summer. Um, was it similar to... 
Which street did we just do? Maple? Mill. Or mm -hmm. Mill Street. So where we had Wellen or inland it was, um, flood zone impacts? Yeah, Mill Street, we were we modified grades. It was a cut, but we were changing grades about six to eight inches in some areas, and that's why we came in because it was more substantial. Uh, we were ripping up all the pavement, regrading. Um, so it was a more substantial reconstruction versus just this, which is going to be a mill and overlay uh, within the existing road limits. Trying to, trying to call up FEMA Map Service Center just to see what the flood zone looks like. Do you have a, do you have a graphic at all that you could put up on the screen and show us? Yep. Um, just give me a moment. Sorry, I have to log into uh, my computer here at work. So I'll try and do that. Is it down by Griswold? Um, yeah, Highland runs from Griswold, uh, comes around by Thornbush, then heads south to the Rocky Hill Town Line. So it's more of the western end of Highland Street that runs along the 1860 Reservoir. I believe it's in the area where the pond is, that the pond up by uh, close to hang, hang dog road, that way. Between, between uh, Thornbush and hang dog. Oh, I see it. Would it adversely affect your schedule to, to come in for a permit? Um, no, I mean, we're, we're not starting construction that quickly. Um, so I would say no, no, it wouldn't. Cause I'm trying to think from consistency with, with um, Mill Street. Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, we typically would not come in for mill and overlay projects. Normally speaking, we could, that a maintenance activity because we're not really changing grade or disturbing the earth. It's going to be paved at all times. Um, but oh, okay. It, so you're not you're not doing the typical mission. curbs and yeah, we're going to try and save whatever curbs we can out there. Some of them will be replaced. I don't know offhand. That's going to be a judgment call in the field during construction. But again, there's a there's probably a six to seven inch uh, pavement lift out there, and we're only taking out two and a half inches and then repaving. So okay. it's always gonna be, we're not gonna be churning it up like we did Mill Street, which was- uh, Yeah, in Mill, Mill Street, there's a lot more earth excavation because you had full depth reconstruction too. Yes, that's correct. We reclaimed and then we had to do some excavation uh, to lower the road in some areas to get the positive grade we were looking for. So this will be just really mill off what's there and put down new asphalt and then patch the curb when necessary. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there'll be some driver apron work, um, some limited drainage. What do you, what, what's the group think? If you want to unmute yourselves for discussion. Uh, since it's a mill and an overlay and staying contained within the curbs, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with uh, not having a formal application. This is Lou. I agree with that as well. Can you guys see the plan? Yeah, this I pulled is Fred. Off? Wouldn't this be something that the executive committee could decide, uh, Jim and Brian and um, Don? 
if, if, I, if need be. I think that's a good idea, just so that you've got something to put into the bid documents for the contractor. So at least they know they're covered. They've got an approval. I mean, if it's a mill and overlay, like Brian said, you're taking it off and putting it back. I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. So we could do like a administrative approval memo. Okay. Yeah, something, something simple like that. Yeah, that's a good idea, Brent. You see the plan on your screen? Yeah. Okay, so it's it's <clears throat> this area. This is Highland Street near Cricket Knoll, um, where we're by the reservoir. This stretch kind of in here near the intersection, I believe. Oh, maybe maybe it's a little further up. It's actually a little probably a little more up here, but we get into the floodplain a little bit. So um, I can give Don a, a plan that kind of shows where that is just to go along with the administrative approval if you want to. Which okay. I Yeah, because I think it's farther to the south, shown on the, the flood mapping, closer to Hangdog. I think between Old Common and Hangdog. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's been a while since I looked at it. So that's this summer? Yes, I'd be in this vicinity. Yeah, we're hoping to get out to bid. Um, right now, I'm waiting on Krug's consultant to uh, do their final review, and I got to address those com comments. Then it goes to DOT what should be a, a quick uh, administrative review. And then uh, once I get the authorization to, to bid it, I'll move forward. Good. Okay, so we'll do that as administrative review or approval. And then moving on to the conservation business, uh, sorry, conservation commission business. Uh, Don, do we have an update on the, the GIS database? update? You no. Know, uh, one of our staff has been working on it a little bit at home, but we're still, we still have a ways to go. Okay. Uh, moving on to the general business portion of the meeting. Uh, we've got the approval of the minutes. So we'll take a, take a minute to look through those and we'll let Sue know if uh, we've got any markups or questions. Uh, does have anybody have any edits? We're good. Do we have a motion to approve the, the minutes? This is Clark Nelson, motion to approve the minutes. And do we have a second? This is Mary Frazier, motion to approve the minutes. So Mary, is that, that a second? It is. Okay, good. And then uh, if you wanna unmute your microphone, we could put it to a vote. So all in favor? Aye. 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 So that passes. And then uh, there's no correspondence, but uh, do we have an update on the regulation um, edits, Don? Uh, I haven't, since the last meeting, I haven't been able to do anything more on them. So maybe just in the coming weeks at home, we'll be able to do something with paving and stuff. I had. Okay. And paving is just about wrapping up. Yep. Okay. So that'll be good. So next, next meeting, we'll probably have something to look at. And then is it, is getting the PDFs to everybody working out okay? Is everybody able to review the plans and the, the documents? Okay. Yes, I'm good. good. Yeah. Okay. This is Clark, yes, they're, they're fine. All right. And then 
Uh, as far as this format, is anybody having any trouble with it? I know it's not ideal, but. I, I think it went very well. I think you handled it very well. I think everybody did a great job. To okay. be honest. Have you heard of anybody that can't connect on at all? Or I hate to be leaving someone out. No, I haven't. Just one time, I guess Lou and Dave had a problem last meeting, but Lou seemed to be, be okay. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? This is Lou, motion to adjourn. And then do we have a second? This is Brent, second it. So we'll unmute and put it to a vote. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And that's a wrap. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. guys. Thank